the Renaissance was a amazing time in a lot of ways. Um, it brought about uh, the focus on observation and reason. It began the uh, focus on the individual as having worth. The problem was that the idea of individual for the Europeans, and when we talk about the Renaissance, although often we refer to it as a time in history, um, it's not specifically a time in history. It is a movement in European culture, in European science and art. Um, and some amazing ideas came out of it. But the time period in which the Renaissance was found, and specifically the age of exploration, had a lot of really negative consequences for um, the people, the indigenous peoples in the lands where they explored. So in this PowerPoint, uh, in this video, I want to go over some information about the First Peoples of Canada, both before contact with Europeans and after. So you can see some of the differences and some of the um, consequences in the way that, that the exploration um, and the colonization of Canada, whereas to the Europeans at the time, seemed like the right thing to do. The indigenous peoples of Canada and the United States and, and the Americas and Africa and uh, India and all of these places where the Europeans colonized, um, it wasn't a it wasn't a good thing in a significant number of ways. We say, well, Winston Churchill um, said that history is written by the victors, and that has been true for a really, really long time. Um, we, in Western society, there's this priority of written history over oral history or, or spoken history with this idea that somehow writing it down makes it more accurate. But writing can be changed and has been changed. Think of the monks that were transcribing texts in the medieval period, like Beowulf, um, who took this, Beowulf was this, this sort of pagan story, um, pre-Christian pagan story, and the monks who wrote it down added Christian elements to it to make it a little more um, what they would call reasonable, um, more, 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 I mean, really more Christian. Um, think of notes that you've taken as a student. When you write it down, how many times have you written down something incorrectly or changed what you've written down um, or gone back and erased it and changed it to something else? just because we're writing something down doesn't make it true. I mean, that's a good thing to remember when we think about, you know, the news too. Just because someone is saying it, just because someone's written it down, just because it's on the internet does not make it true. Um, but the first peoples of Canada were non-literate. Note non-literate, not illiterate. Illiterate suggests that they lacked literacy um, that they could have been literate and chose not to. Um, they were non-literate, meaning that writing simply wasn't a part of their culture. Uh, they transmitted their history through speaking, through repeating the, the uh, oral history stories over and over again from person to person and passing them down. And because they did it this way, because they did it through um, orality, the European society that came in didn't acknowledge their histories. Um, but it's really important to note that history, whether it's oral or written, history is constructed by the historian. And we looked at that a little bit when we were looking at the web of history. Um, you chose what to put in and what to leave out. There's a difference between the past, which is everything that happened, and history, 
which is the story we choose to tell about the significant events of the past. But somebody has to decide what's significant. So up until about 2015, which is when the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada published its findings on the effect of residential schools, the history that Canadians told themselves, and this is the history that I learned as a child, it excluded most of the history of the First Peoples. It wasn't taught in schools, um, except maybe some semi-stereotypical lessons in grade four about Aboriginal hunters and gatherers. Um, it wasn't shared, it wasn't known, but that doesn't mean that it didn't exist. And now, since 2015, um, BC and Canada in particular are making a concerted effort to ensure that we share these histories. Um, so the First Nations of Canada, historians, by which I mean Europeans, uh, divided them into geographic location. And whereas that's not actually necessarily the best way of dividing them, I'm gonna use it for right now and talk a little bit about it because there were some commonalities in those areas. So there were the Mi'kmaq, um, roughly in the Atlantic area. area. They spent the warmer spring and summer on the coast, fishing and hunting, and sometimes going out to sea for whales. They spent the fall and winter inland. They would settle near smaller bodies of water to hunt, fish, and trap. The Woodlands First Nations were those of central eastern uh, Ontario specifically, uh, but the central eastern area. They lived in many smaller groups uh, in boreal forests. They were hunters who migrated to follow the animals that they, fund, that they hunted. They used spears and bows and trapped in their own distinct territories. Uh, Arakean practiced agricultural. They were in the southern part of, uh, again, mostly Ontario. Uh, they practiced agriculture on fertile land. Um, they had permanent locations, which was fairly rare with most of the Canadians' first peoples. Um, they had thriving democratic societies with women who headed families, um, who headed the families specifically, not just general. Uh, they lived in longhouses. Uh, the Plains First Nations were in the prairies. They uh, lived in grasslands. They were migratory groups for the most part. Uh, they tended to gather together in the summer for feasts, ceremonies, and hunting, such as buffalo. Um, and they would, they would need enough meat and hides to last the rest of the year when they came together to hunt buffalo. The First Peoples of the Pacific Coast had really rich food sources, uh, salmon, shellfish, other seafood. And they had, many of them had permanent homes made from huge red cedars. Uh, often several families would live together. There was a distinct social system and aristocracy in most of the Pacific Coast First Nations. The first peoples who lived in the Mackenzie and the First Nations people who lived in the Mackenzie and Yukon River Basin, um, it was Northwestern. It's a really challenging place to survive. The area was swampy and barren. Um, they chose their leaders based on who could provide. Hunters were revered because there was very little game. Winters were harsh. They tended to keep to their own territories to hunt um, and had portable homes so that they could follow the food source. In addition to the First Nations, which are divided into these geographic locations, there were the Inuit who lived in Northern Canada um, they had a distinct language and mostly hunted and fished to survive. And then there are the Métis, um, who were mixed European or French Canadian fishermen and fur traders who married uh, Aboriginal women, First Nations women, mostly located along fur trade routes. Uh, when we use Métis now, um, it's usually met meant in the more literal mixed blood sense, Métis mixed. When you look at the map of BC, um, 
I want you to, like all of these areas that are circled in different colors, notice how much of the land was occupied when the first settlers came. Historians believe that the first people arrived in the Americas sometime between 73,000 and 14,000 years ago. Uh, the Bering Strait crossing um, up sort of near Russia and Canada is the most widely accepted theory um, with the idea that when the ice ages caused the sea level to drop, there was a land bridge that connected what is now Russia and Alaska that allowed nomadic groups to cross. Um, but there's a lot of theories that some people maybe came by sea from the area around Japan. The sea cross current in, the, in that time frame would have made the crossing possible. And I mean, Australia was populated by roughly 50,000 years ago. So that only could have been by boat, which means that the idea that people could sail uh, around that time to America is pretty, pretty feasible, pretty believable. There's archaeological proof that people have been in the Americas for at least 36,000 years, likely coming in about three to four waves of migration and likely coming originally from Asia, though there are suggestions that some may have come from Europe as well. According to uh, Dixon, who wrote a um, history of uh, First Peoples in Canada, the Americas were one of the most complex linguistic regions in the world, which means, or at least it suggests, that the First Peoples were here for a very long time because language is one of the slowest things to change. Um, and in the 16th century, so 1500s in the Americas, when uh, Europeans were coming over, there were about 2,200 distinct languages, different languages in the Americas, um, about 50 to 70 languages in 12 family groups, six of which were exclusive to BC, uh, around 700 to 1,000 CE. So linguistic theory because of this suggests that Canada was settled um, no more than 1500 years ago, uh, probably starting with the Pacific Northwest. Uh, even if you look recently, um, like as of 1996, there were 36 distinct languages in BC. But when you think about that, in 700 to 1000 CE, there were 50 to 70 languages in 12 family groups here in BC. And now there are 39 languages. In the 15th century, about 10% of people, of First Peoples, were on the Pacific coast. This is before first contact. There were 112.5 million First Peoples before first contact. To compare, in Europe, if we don't count Russia, there were about 70 million people at that same time. Um, Pre-contact culture, there, there are differences between different nations. There are differences between the different areas. Um, but in general, pre-contact culture was fairly uh, egalitarian, they shared wealth and resources, there was a high value on personal liberty and freedom, but it emphasized the group as well as the self. Uh, land usually was owned by the group, cultural knowledge was passed generation to generation and guarded jealously. Um, an individual lived in a web of obligation and privilege that operated on the basis of reciprocity, of giving um, and being generous, particularly with regards to, to making things and, and to the economy. Respect was hugely important. There was a division of labor between men and women, but it was ruled by people ruled by consensus for the most part. And in fact, in many nations in BC, lineage, um, like your, your, the family that you belong to, was traced through your mother. 
um, and land and rights were owned by the women. Um, looking at the West Coast, uh, there were permanent settles, settlements around 13 to 15,000 years ago. Um, in the West Coast, many nations pretty much stayed in place because they depended on the sea for food. So they were less nomadic than other peoples. Um, the first contact in Canada was with the Norse around 1000 CE. Um, they found the Canadian First Peoples, uh, hunters and gatherers. They, um, the technology, when we talk about technology, we usually think things like computers or things like that, but technology uh, can be just tools. And the Canadian First Peoples had an incredible wealth of knowledge about their own ecosystem and how to use it to their advantage rather than having um, advanced tools. Uh, they just knew, they had learned, they had um, discovered uh, a lot of information about the land in which they lived and how to get the best out of it. Um, in fact, about 500 or more drugs that we use today were originally used by First Peoples of various places. I talked briefly about the division of labor um, in the Semiamu First Nations. Indigenous women have property rights going back hundreds of years. Uh, they owned clam beds, um, islands. Uh, women owned these back uh, before first contact, owned these woolly dogs um, whose wool was used to make blankets. Uh, and they needed a place to put their dogs when they were in heat so that they wouldn't be impregnated by, you know, sort of regular hunting dogs. Uh, so they, they own these islands. Um, the dogs are now extinct, though. Uh, families would own different fishing sites. When we think about European people in this time frame, um, for the Europeans, Discipline meant acceptance of a supreme authority, uh, God often, but also the king, and the ability to act in close cooperation with others. For the First Peoples, discipline was mostly an individual matter, um, though there were some excep ex exceptions to this. Discipline was being able to last for long periods with little to no food. Um, it was the calm endurance of inconvenience, of hardships, of suffering. It was the resistance of fatigue, of tiredness. Uh, discipline meant thinking for oneself in battle, which was very opposed to the European way of uh, following orders. And um, for First Peoples, discipline meant a code of bravery that did not equal dying in battle for the most part, uh, but it did include what you'd think of as proper behavior under torture, which is not a universal practice. Um, in a lot of cases, the uh, code of bravery was, um, you know, fighting until the very end, uh, fighting until, well, un until you died, until that was it. Um, and that wasn't the case in um, most First Nations beliefs. The natural world was really significantly important to uh, First Peoples and um, that was because they saw the universe as this um, interconnected web of personalized powers, big ones and small ones, um, ones that would help us and ones that were dangerous to us. Um, but the equilibrium, the balance was based on reciprocity. It was based on, I will do something for you and you will do something for me. And, and when I say I and you, it's not just people. It's not 
human beings. Um, all living things were, um, were, were seen as having a personality, but many non-living things were as well. Um, the idea of harmony between people and nature was hugely important. Uh, all living beings were related, and so this harmony had to be maintained. You could influence it through um, what you gave and what you asked, but you couldn't control it. In terms of spirituality, um, the most respected people in uh, most First Nations groups were shamans. Um, who had a special ability to communicate with the spirit world, to make alliances. Their main duty was to cure and prevent disease. Most shaman were men, but not all. Uh, there were important spirit, spirits connected with food, health, fertility, and war that the shaman would be in charge of praying to and, and connecting with, communicating with. Um, and even the construction of homes and the layouts of the village uh, conformed to a spiritual order. They're, they were focused around the center rather than focused around the boundary, the outside. Your, an individual's life and status was determined by spirits and by animal powers that volunteered to be helpers, uh, usually found through a vision quest at puberty. In terms of government, pre-contact, um, there were different ways of choosing leaders. In some nations, uh, leaders were chosen according to their qualifications. In other nations, there was a, a hierarchical uh, choice of leaders. So there were some people who had a sort of higher status um, than others. Um, the leaders were meant to represent the common will, the will of everybody. And for the most part, their authority came from their eloquence and charisma, their ability to speak persuasively and to convince people rather than their ability to force others to do what they wanted. And probably that was because of the spiritual need to maintain harmony. Um, so having harmony both within the nature, like within nature in general, and within the nation. Um, there was a need for trade or raiding uh, because there was really an equal distribution of resources. Think back to the different areas of the First Nations. I mean, if you think to the Pacific Coast where they had pretty much access to food when they needed it because of the proximity, because they were close to the sea. Whereas the northern, uh, the Yukon uh, River Basin, the Mackenzie River Basin, uh, they were in a really difficult place in terms of having access to enough food. Um, I want you to take a look at these two pictures. So this, the top one, that's the photograph that was taken. The bottom one is a etching or sort of a drawing that was done for a British newspaper. So these are the two. Notice the differences. The people, more or less the same but not entirely. But the background in particular, they have this English oak tree in the background. Um, there isn't the, um, the logging and this extra house over on the right-hand side that you see in the photograph. Uh, and I want you to take a moment and think about why that is. Why would a British newspaper create a different image in order to, you know, sell newspapers. Remember that one of the things that the 
Europeans wanted uh, at this point in time. And this is this is after, obviously, after colonization. But they wanted more Europeans to come over. So they wanted uh, Canada and the US to look like a familiar, inviting place, someplace they might like to live. For most First Nations, generosity was significant. Uh, it was important um, and it also sort of added to your status. So uh, potlatches were basically feasts for hundreds of people who were coming to your territory. They showed your generosity. Um, you would give fancy gifts to the most important people. You would, you can see in this picture, toss blankets off the longhouse roof for others. Um, and it also showed your power. It was a form of legal documentation um, of recognizing alliances or making alliances of the transfer of power or property. Um, gifts were metaphors for words. Uh, and treaties, when, when you made an agreement, um, they weren't seen to be self-sustaining. They had to be kept alive. They had to be sort of fed every once in a while by ceremony uh, and ceremonial exchanges. Um, so when we're looking um, at these pictures and, and at this idea of the oral tradition, remember that we don't write things down in um, First Nations uh, traditions. The a law and the knowledge is passed on orally, spoken from word to word. So in order to have an agreement that everybody um, that everybody knows and everybody follows, you have all of these people who are here to observe the transfer of power or property. Um, so they all know about it and they can all communicate that and they can all speak up for it. Uh, in the in a, in an oral tradition. So there were a lot of differences between First Nations, and I'm not just talking in terms of the geographical separations, but in each individual First Nation in any given area. But there were some commonalities as well. Um, most people, most First Peoples practice severe self-discipline. Uh, the goal was to acquire as much personal power as possible, but in service of your nation. Humor was highly valued. The law of hospitality was hugely important and, and being inhospitable was actually considered a crime. Um, most First Nations believed in the unity of the universe, that it was filled with spirits and powers of various types and importance. Um, and all living beings were related and had minds, including some objects that the Western world considers to be inanimate. Uh, there was a lot of attention to detail and war wasn't so much for raiding, um, except on the West Coast. It was more for revenge, blood revenge, uh, to build your individual prestige um, and to capture prisoners, either to adopt into your nation or for sacrifice. This is a image of um, Samuel de Champlain's encounter with a group of 200 Iroquois. He says, with one shot, he took out two of their chiefs and wounded a third so that he later died. Um, this is a good example of thinking about perspective. Uh, this, this illustration is, would you say it's from a Western perspective or from a First Peoples perspective? And what would be your evidence for that? 
When you look at the difference between the views of the Europeans and the views of the First Peoples, um, a lot of, I'm not going to read the quote because you can read it, um, but there were a lot of differences between how First Peoples saw uh, the world and how the Europeans saw the world. Um, it, First Peoples of Canada uh, and to a large extent um, the US, they had a very egalitarian society, a very equal society. They had a view of humanity as part of this um, human universal system um, that was beyond anything else. Europe was developing capitalism, was uh, coming into, remember, like we talked about the Renaissance and, and the idea of secularism and humanism and individualism that in Europe at the time there was this focus on humanity as the center of the universe but of the universe but also as in control of it humanity as being the most important thing and able to control the world around us whereas in the first people's uh, worldviews you couldn't control the world around you. You were a part of the world around you. You were part of this universal system, but you weren't necessarily the most important part. In fact, you were not the most important part. You were equal to other, um, other groups, uh, other parts of the universe, and, and the focus wasn't on controlling it because you couldn't control it. You could influence it. But you couldn't control it. Um, and we can see this in their attitudes towards land. Uh, First Peoples had the idea of common property. Uh, property was often owned by a group, either the nation or maybe a family, um, but not usually by the individual. Whereas in Europe, um, land and property was owned by an individual. And it's the same thing with cultural knowledge. Uh, in First Peoples, knowledge was an individual privilege. It was passed from in a family from one generation to the next, and it was jealously guarded. Whereas in Europe, knowledge was publicly available. They were moving towards the system where everything was shared. Um, in, in larger groups uh, through universities and through the printing press and things like that. First contact occurred in the late 16th and early 17th century. Um, when the Europeans came in, they believed that the First Peoples did not believe anything, did not have any laws, um, did not live by any laws, did not have any rulers. Um, and this was uh, Christian Leclerc, a Franciscan friar and a missionary to the Mi'kmaq in the 17th century. Um, they, in the beginning, um, they focused mostly on trade. Uh, and, and that did continue through the colonial period. Most of their exchanges were friendly. Remember, the First Peoples had a very strong focus on hospitality. Um, so when these strangers came, um, their, the beliefs and the, the society of the First Peoples required, in a sense, generosity, required hospitality. That was hugely important. Um, the Europeans, uh, at least some of them responded by kidnapping First Peoples to bring them back to uh, the European countries as proof that they existed uh, in the Americas and also to make sure that they could learn uh, European languages, Spanish or French or English or whatever, 
so that they could act as a guide to uh, the Europeans who were coming. Um, colonialism, the European powers came and took over control of the land and turned the land in Canada and America and a lot of other places into colonies of British or French or Spanish or Portuguese or European powers. Um, and there are a few causes for that. Uh, Europe was um, expanding, there were more people, they needed land and resources because they were going through theirs at a fairly quick rate. Uh, so by taking over the land of uh, the Americas and of um, Australia and of, of Africa and India and all of these different places, uh, they could get some of the resources that they needed. They had very different ideas of civilization and how to live, both the Europeans uh, when compared to the First Peoples. Um, and when the Europeans looked at how the First Peoples lived, they, and, and this is true of the indigenous peoples of, of anywhere that they went pretty much, they had, um, they didn't see those people as civilized. Uh, they believed that the indigenous peoples were going to be, um, were going to go extinct because they weren't civilized. They didn't know how to live in, quote, the world. Um, and the Europeans, of course, did. So from the perspective of the Europeans, they were doing the right thing. They were making sure that their people had the land and the resources that they need. Um, they were bringing these, what they thought were uh, backwards people into civilization, meaning civilization as they saw it. Um, they were saving them. Uh, you know, the Europeans believed very strongly that Christianity was the only way to live after death it was the it was the guide for the world and in the medieval period that sort of showed in persecution of jews and in the crusades um, and other religious wars and in the age of exploration that showed in trying to force indigenous peoples to become christian uh, whatever variety of Christian the European group coming in followed. Um, and there were consequences to what they were doing. And some of those consequences were the conversion to Christianity, forced conversion to Christianity. Um, some of those consequences were smallpox and other European diseases that wiped out huge, huge numbers of First Peoples. Um, some of the consequences were that the first peoples were forced onto reserves on small areas of land where they they had to stay uh, even if they had originally been nomadic moving around for the food um, and often not in or near their territory and almost always not the best land because the best land was used for the europeans coming in um, residential schools to teach uh, the First Peoples in the minds of the Europeans the right way to behave, how to be civilized, to teach the language, to teach Christianity. Um, banning potlatches because it was such a significant part of how First Peoples lived. Um, and the Canadian government um, took on responsibility for, as they called them, Indians. Uh, because they saw First Peoples as, in part because of this, this belief that they, are, they were not civilized, the First Peoples were seen almost as children. So the Canadian government took responsibility for them. 
So one of the things I want you to keep in mind um, as we're going through learning about the Renaissance and learning about First Peoples is this idea of historical perspective. The Europeans didn't come to uh, Canada for bad reasons. They didn't think they were doing anything wrong. In fact, they thought they were helping. They thought that they could uh, help First Peoples live properly, get into heaven, and be, quote, civilized, end quote. But when you look at it from the perspective of the people who are living here, which is what I've tried to show through this video and through this PowerPoint, um, the perspective of the First Peoples is that they had amazing, complex, uh, valid systems of government and law and civilization and society um, that worked really well for them, that worked really well for the land that they lived in, and that was, uh, in a lot of cases, more respectful of the earth and the land than European beliefs were. The main European belief was that, um, that the world was created for humans and humanity had a right and a responsibility to exert control. And the main belief relative to that, at least in terms of the First Peoples, was that humanity is a part of this um, system of this universe not the most important part, not the part in control, uh, an, an important part, sure, but so was everything else. Um, it was part of this larger web and you had to tend the web carefully so that you could keep living here, so that the land would be able to support us and we'd be able to continue to live. And because those two perspectives were so very different, um, a lot of really negative things happened through colonialism.